Good morning and yeah. welcome to our OLSHF webinar series. Today's town hall webinar should be a really good opportunity for folks to learn a little bit more about the needs that exist as a result of the recent wildfires here in Oregon and Northern California. And we have a series of panelists uh, of lions from around the state that are gonna give us an idea of what the particular needs are in their area, uh, the response to these needs and, and possibly even what we can do uh, to help those that have been affected uh, by the wildfires. I, I will let you know that we have experienced a couple of sort of technical challenges in terms of some of our images. Um, so if I'm referring to a fire map and talking about, oh gosh, I don't know, some of the Southern Oregon fires, such as the Almeda fire or the Archie Creek fire, and you're not able to see the, those images, I'm sorry for that. Um, moving up uh, the I-5 corridor you know, to the, um, Holiday Farm fires and the Beachy Creek and Lion's Head fires, uh, the Riverside fire, Riverside fire in Clackamas County, uh, all told, as you're probably more aware than I am, Oregon has experienced pretty much its worst wildfire season uh, in history, uh, with over a million acres uh, that have been destroyed, hundreds of homes, thousands of buildings and, and, and businesses have been affected. I think there's been a total of 468 individual fires. Tragically, 10 people have lost their lives. Uh, and, and again, hundreds, if not thousands, thousands have been affected uh, by the wildfires. Uh, I want to introduce our panelists today uh, in no particular order, uh, but the, in terms of the order of when, where I can see you, we have John Taylor, uh, District Governor um, from District G. John, thanks for being here today. My pleasure, and thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, we have Mr. Bob Cheney, past district governor uh, from District E. Bob, thank you for being here also. Well, thank you, Doug, for allowing me to uh, be a part of this. Other uh, district governors, we have Linda Stent uh, representing District R. Good morning, Linda, and thank you for being here today. Good morning, thank you. We also have uh, a past chair of the Oregon Lions Side Hearing Foundation and a past district governor, probably passed too many titles to name them all, but current LCIF uh, multiple district coordinator, Sharon Rollins. Sharon, thanks uh, for being here and nice to see you. Good morning, it's good to see all of you. We also have Charlene Larson, uh, as many of you are aware, um, Charlene for many years has played the role of MD36 Lions Disaster Response Coordinator. Charlene, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. We also anticipate the possible arrival of Sherry Young, the district governor from District O. And we have a couple of staff members from the Oregon Lions Side Hearing Foundation. On your screen, you can see uh, Kelly Asbra, who is our optical director. Good morning, Kelly. Good morning, thank you for having me. And we also have our programs director, programs and operations director, uh, Kareth Vance, who you cannot see at this time, but you can, you will certainly hear from her later. Good morning, Kareth. Okay, um, we're just going to jump right into this, and we're going to go by district by district, and we're going to hear uh, a little bit of an overview again of uh, the damage that has taken place due to the wildfires as we know it and uh, what some of the needs are that exist. And I'm just gonna go ahead and start with District R. And uh, Linda, why don't you give us an overview of what has taken place in your Lions District? Well, we hit the jackpot. We got all the big fires. We've got Lions Head, Beachy Creek, Holiday Farm, Echo Mountain. And Riverside's kind of a toss up whether it's O or R. I think it's, it lapses over you know, both districts. So. But in District R, I'll give you some statistics. We've had 20 injuries, six fatalities, almost 1,200. These, um, these are not the most current numbers, but these are what I got about three or four days ago, and then I had to get my computer worked on. So um, 1,200 residences burned, another 1,200 just miscellaneous structures, and just over 710,000 acres have been burned. Um, we got our LCIF grant of $10,000, which we've been dispersing. Um, and we also got a $2,000 or a $1,000. Yeah, well, I can't now. I think one or 2,000 from South Salem. And we're using that money 
to purchase things that aren't covered by the LCIF grant and stuff. Oh, yeah, no. One of the big things that's going on is in the Staten Silverton Gates area is there's a field kitchen been set up with the Staten Lions and the Silverton Lions and they're feeding three meals a day and they're feeding evacuees who are like trying to go back in to see their property plus the first responders the first day at lunch they had 250 people and so we we spent a bunch of our lcif money on uh, supplies for the kitchen different food products and cleaning supplies that type of thing we also um paid for a month's rent on a dumpster to put at the kitchen so and we're kind of i kind of feel that's part of the lcif thing but if push comes to shove we'll take it out of the the south salem money or out of john's money thank you john <laughs> yeah. but um it's been interesting doing stuff um as a formal re former Red Cross volunteer, I'm really amazed that I'm getting a lot of reports of the Red Cross does not play nice in the sandbox. Right. And, stuff. and I mean, I've I deployed nationally for different disasters, and we were always glad for any kind of help that we could get. But it's like, I think when my family, we are dealing with one national Red Cross person, and she's very helpful and everything. I think the problem is the volunteers were doing it dealing with here at the different sites are getting kind of territorial. You know, this this is what we're doing and we don't want you to help us and that type of thing. But I went up to um, the Echo Mountain Fire, I went up to Lincoln City and they're supposed to be at the community center. I went up there, that was the Red Cross doing lodging and food for the lodgers. So then they sent me to, I'd never been to Lincoln City. I didn't know they had an outlet mall, but that, that's where it was set up. So I got over there and they that's more where they had their multi-agency resource center thing going because they had FEMA was there and the Red Cross and, and all of that. But they weren't looking for any of the kind of stuff that you know we were trying to do. So two or three doors down from where I was was uh it used to be a store called The Loft, which I've never heard of, but they when the pandemic hit they bailed out of that outlet mall so there's a big open big open space and they've set up you know there's shelves full of food and there's racks full of clothes and we're running into a lot of people that don't blame them with used clothing is problems sometimes it's not clean plus with covid who knows so when i was talking to the volunteers in there in the evacuee store as they called it if they needed anything specific and i had a request for jean men's jeans for a certain size men and women's underwear men and women's socks and backpacks so that was late in the day so i drove back to florence and then in the morning drove back up to newport to the walmart got what they'd asked drove again up to lincoln city and they were happy as clams to get all that stuff so but you know, we're working on it. I've had one person call about glasses and she was a part of the holiday farm thing, but we didn't have anything set up as far as glasses. I had her get one of my Florence Club's eyeglass applications and fill it out and, and we'll deal with that. But she was from Holiday Farm and I said, well, where are the evacuees? She said, from Holiday Farm. She said, they're all over the place. That's, there's, we had a whole long list of evacuation sites and some of them have now shut down completely some of, one of them is like open only on fridays and i which i think is really weird but okay so right now what i'm doing mostly is trying to track down all these sites and find out who's operational and who's not but the, a lot of the local district r alliance clubs have been jumping in and helping out you know, working at food pantries or, you know, stuff like that. So, but it's it's a lot of people impacted, you know. And the numbers I had with the residents, I, I suspect it's probably doubled 
because some of these fires have just continued them on. Mm -hmm. and, and I had one chart uh, that the governor put out and it showed um, what percentage contained the fires were, and they're still not very contained. So anyhow, that's it for R. Okay, thanks, Linda. Um, I believe that um, in terms of an R, the holiday farm fire as of yesterday was about 65% contained, uh, about 173,000 acres uh, were burned. Um, I think that's 65 to 67% containment for holiday farm. I believe that is relatively accurate. Also in District R, uh, Beachy Creek, where over 400,000 acres uh, were burned, I believe as of last night was about 58% contained. These are statistics that I found from the Department of Forestry. So uh, mm. take that for what that's worth. I think they're pretty accurate. Linda, thanks for that update. We're going to move on to uh, District O. Sherry Young has joined us. Um, really quickly, I also want to mention that uh, Linda mentioned multi-agency resource centers. Uh, the acronym mm -hmm. for those, I believe, are MARCS. I think Charlene mm -hmm. is going to talk. Maybe even Sharon might both talk a little bit more about MARCS, the multi-agency resource centers, which I believe is an avenue where we may be able to work with to, to help people in need. Um, Sherry, why don't you give us a little bit of an overview, um, five to seven minutes or so of what is going on in District O. But we need to, you to unmute yourself. What Sherry is gonna do here in just a moment. Yeah, you're still muted. Uh, it's it is on the opposite side of the screen here. Now, yeah. I, as a test, if I used this about thirty six O, is that backwards to you guys, or can you read it? No, it's fine. So thirty six O is um, includes more or less seven counties in the northwest corner of Oregon, and the counties become important when we are trying to figure out technically where the fires are and also who is going to have lead on the government end of things in addressing them. So I've had, being a resident of Clackamas County, I've had no doubt that uh, our district needs to deal with the Riverside fire that's uh, up to around 138,000 acres now and but has been you know, like at 134 since two weeks ago. It's considered, it's, Doug has probably got that last stat on whether it's 30 something percent contained now, but um, they're doing a pretty, they, they feel like it's pretty well contained now and will not in fact hit Estacada, but it's been within a half mile of Estacada and it, it, it caused the whole county to be under some level of evacuation orders. So all of our zone, um, the zone which is the West Cascades um, was affected. Mount Hood lions were very active within because they had smoke like all of us. And our fires essentially, as opposed to some of Linda's, began with that wind event on the night after Labor Day, and the fires were spreading rapidly after that. So trees take down power poles, power poles strike strike um, fires, and then the wind event moving at 40 to 60 miles an hour overnight and pretty strong into the next day, just pushed all those fires into, uh, being very active and Beachy Creek, for example, and I think Lion's Head began actually in middle of August, but the problems for people really came with that wind event where it just shoved dramatically through the canyons. Our clubs and our people, um, I said we are surf to summit and our clubs from Surf to Summit were at least some of them responding, including Astoria, preparing for people to come up 
from wherever they came. Marlena said, we don't decide where they're coming from. We just handle them when they're there. The fire, Echo Mountain fire that Linda referred to is on the line between our two districts, but it's just, it's in Lincoln County. Nonetheless, there were people that went up to Till Tillamook Fairgrounds, and I don't know if some of them went to Astoria. Because as the current joke for me goes, when you're evacuating a fire, you don't think first of where is my Lions Club district? That'll be in the future. <laughs> and so um, those people now will be handled through the Lincoln City Center because they are from very largely from Lincoln County. So it does it does make it important for those of us who are doing disaster response as lions to pay attention to where our boundaries are and where the county lines are uh, or city lines but we all have some cities that uh, are in more than one county moving inland there was a fire in Chehala mountain i had my stats in front of me but i don't know i can't remember right now if it was 1,200 and some acres or 2,000, you can look that up. So that meant there were people in our, the districts around McMinnville and Amity that could have been taking people in. We had in our district, looking at the county lists as I was trying to, like Linda, figure out where shelters and evacuation centers were, um, 15 places people were being sent to. And then progressively, since some of those began by being in West Clackamas County, people moved into the fairgrounds and four other points, um, Clackamas Community College at the west side of Clackamas County, but then when the fires and smoke were worse, they had to move on. So that's where they could have ended up in Forest Grove or St. Paul. And that puts them under more stress and made it harder for us to figure out where we should be. But one of the things I will say and speak more to later is we were not, we needed to be have our clubs ready for response. And certainly some of them did including Milwaukee and Lake Oswego. And um, I've already mentioned the coast, but certainly Estacada and Mount Hood. But other clubs did not have in mind, even that they should go or send somebody to evaluate the, re the response centers that were identified. And I did send two emails to zone chairs and to the presidents and secretaries of the club saying, here's my six questions. We need to know, can you go and check out what's going on in these formally identified, I'm saying evacuation centers, because what many of us saw was um, not official shelters. There were official shelters such as Red Cross was running in the convention center, but a um, vast number of people were in parking lots, some official, some non-official, and nobody was particularly um, there to register them other than to identify by, the run by whoever owned the parking lot, were you registered with Clackamas Community or Clackamas Town Center or the Langers, I always say it wrong, a place over in Sherwood. And so we didn't have a real handle on that and we were not as well prepared as we should have been to go out and feed people, but we certainly have explored that and we'll learn how to do that in the future. Mount Hood people um, sheltered and in my area. I think many of us know where evacuees were sheltered in someone's backyard 
particularly in the cases around Wilsonville, where people who have horses and livestock took in people with their horses or livestock and let them camp on their personal property. It's important for us to think about in the future and identify those kinds of people and how, if we're ready to start off the bat, we can support them. Mount Hood um, did a lot of sheltering people in homes, their personal homes and those they knew, and then making runs for gas and propane in order to keep the generators going within those homes so those people could have water and showers and food. And um, that was a, another very strong club response, but it didn't necessarily go out as the club doing it. It was the lions who were doing it. And as Decatur had uh, what was, I did double check when I heard that there were complaints there that lions were personally fighting fires. And there was a statement that the firemen abandoned the city. Um, Oregon Live had some confirmation about what, why the fire people did what they did. But I think another role for us as whoever is organizing disaster response is to be able to verify the stories that you're hearing. It's not our job to pass them along, except we can pass them back to Oregon BOAD. We can be advocates within the system and then communicate that if we have heard it when we're working later in the mark centers i think it's um, a, a final tip i will give people is when you see good information on your laptop take a screenshot i've got tons of screenshots because these things change so rapidly and the sites change and linda and i worked with linda too has done a excel sheet where are the fires? What is the district? How many, we need to go then to how many structures are lost, how many um, in which fires, and it's houses, it's structures, it's evacuation. And you kind of need those numbers when you're doing that application to LCIF. Some county officials are very helpful and others do not want to say anything because they don't want to be said to be creating panic. They don't want to be said to be under um, estimating the situation. So they put out certain statements at certain times and then they correct them later. So I'm, yes, still working at what should I submit to LCIF and I'll comment on that more later. Because even though I sent set my, my phone to tell me when my time was up, I didn't push start on it. So there. Yeah, I think you did just fine, Sherry. Thank you for that report. Um, regarding the percentage of containment for Riverside, um, on the state of Oregon fire and hotspot dashboard that I'm looking at, it does say 37% containment of Riverside. We're going to move on to District E and, and past District Governor Bob Cheney, who I think is going to tell us a little bit about um, the Almeda fire that unfortunately uh, tore through the Phoenix talent area, uh, which I believe though that that fire is not considered an active fire anymore. I believe that's accurate. And of course, the Archie Creek fire through the Roseburg area, which is about 76% contained as of now. Bob, thanks for joining us. Well, now I don't have to say anything. You already said it. So thank, <laughs> thanks for everything. <laughs> no. The fires throughout here, those are the, those are the uh, Sherry, uh, you Sherry. yourself. It said I was muted. Yeah. Oh, but it's you're ec you're echoing. So. There you go. Uh, the main two were the Alameda and the Archie Creek, but there's been several other fires as well. Uh, one around the Sutherland area, one up around Diamond Lake, one down around Eagle Point, uh, and several other smaller fires. Uh, basically, in essence, all uh, all of District E from the Cascades to the to the coast uh, were in a ready set go mode. So, but I had a meeting with uh, District Governor Carol Lee last night, and as many of you know, she's been attempting to uh, 
to uh, secure an LCIF grant. And af after we met last night, it was her decision, along with uh, the, other, the rest of us that were at that meeting, myself and past council chair Gail Black and a few others, that because all of our fires and relief efforts are in the mode that they don't need supplies, clothing or any of that, what they need is cash to leverage the specific needs of individual victims. And as we all know, we can't use the LCIF grant as cash disbursements. So it was uh, our decision not to pursue the LCIF grant at this okay. point. Right. Uh, but with that said, we're also sending out a letter to all of our clubs throughout the district and asking them to, uh, if they feel obligated or if they can afford to make cash contributions to the uh, these different relief efforts. And if, uh, I believe Brenda was gonna put up a couple of websites that I had, uh, had given her where uh, the city of Ashland is handling, Parks and Recreation has a wonderful website that is handling all of the, and has a listing of all the relief efforts for the Alameda fire. And if you just go to City of Ashland, you can get to that. And as far as the Archie Creek, there is a listing on InsaWeb. Uh, if you go to InsaWeb, I-N-C-I-W-E-B.gov, and just search Archie Creek, a listing of all the needed things are there as well. Oh, here we go. There's there's one of the, that's the one for, uh, Ashland in the and there's also another uh, site for Ashland which is the Rogue Valley Recovers and you see it uh, listed on that sheet there and and that was where and they're saying on their cash donation is what would be best for them I agree that uh, that yes uh, they do need the other things as well but cash can be leveraged much <laughs> much more than just providing the supplies because then it can be targeted specifically so and uh thank you john I, i'll thank you again for uh, what your club has done and i don't know what else uh, there's the arch creek one uh i don't know what else i can provide as far as information getting tied into this just very recently uh i've been following it a little bit our clubs in the area were right on the fringe. Sutherland was on the fringe, Roseburg Umpqua, Roseburg, Myrtle Creek on the fringe, uh, Eagle, Eagle Point, Prospect, Ashland, Jacksonville, all on the fringe of, of the fires. And I don't know that any of them uh, were directly affected, anybody in those. I have not heard of anybody in the clubs being directly affected. Or anything like that i uh but other than that there's not much more i can say doug is there anything that you would like to hear that i haven't said and are you paying attention <laughs> i am always paying attention to you bob i am guilty of responding to a contact in marion county that uh has some possible suggestions of uh of needs of assistance, so sorry for doing that. Um, but thanks again for stepping in and giving us a report on, on, on District E. Appreciate that very much. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move along to District G, our District Governor, John Taylor, who is a Pendleton Lion, and I think might even have some, some interesting news to share, even though his area hasn't been beset by wildfires. John, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much, glad to be here. As uh, Bob was saying, uh, District G was hit by the fringe of, uh, I think it was Lion's Head, but at that point it was in a unoccupied area. My district is 48,377 square miles, and most of that is miles and miles of nothing but miles and miles. So while we have had a number of fires burning, they have been range or scrub or some forest, such as uh, recently in Ukiah, south of Pendleton, where they did do some evacuations, but those were of hunters, mushroomers, and that sort of thing. So there was no structure lost. Warm Springs has 
had a fairly sizable fire, but again, it's mostly in unincorporated, uninhabited areas, and there will be federal relief as needed there since it was on a reservation. Um, so I will say that there were some survivors that did come east uh, in their RVs. They ended up scattered along from Lapine to Madras, but uh, not that many. We tried to get a head count to see if we had enough people that would qualify for an LCIF grant. Never could get past more than maybe a dozen or two. So uh, we didn't meet the threshold of uh, numbers. The Lapine Lions have been pretty active. They've been sending several trailer loads of hard supplies, cleaning supplies and that sort of thing over to the west. I think they're ending up in Linda's area at least primarily. Uh, but I'm very glad to say that today my Pendleton Lions Club board took some direct action since we can't uh, readily send supplies and since the need is more, as Bob is saying, for money to leverage things, uh, we have sent a thousand or will be sending a thousand dollars to multiple district treasurer Brian Renich to work with the three district governors over there so that each district will get a little bit and hopefully directed towards the some sort of immediate needs, like maybe a little versatile. We don't send strings with it, Linda, so you maybe have some money for your dumpster, thanks to uh, the Pendleton Lions. But we also uh, came up with $2,000 to send to LCIF, partly in recognition of the COVID grant that we received and also the disaster relief things that they are doing over on the west side. So while we can't be there necessarily in person, we're trying the next best thing, send money. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, money speaks loudly, but I learned in the February flooding that lions are not as well prepared as we would like to be. There's a whole lot of work that needs to be done and prepared and we need the flexibility of lion's cash without going through LCIF. So I've been toying with some ideas to try to figure out how we might be able to accomplish that on a district level, multiple district level, I should say. Anyway, that's pretty much the summary from the dry side of the state where at least in Pendleton, it's still sunny. Thank you, John. Appreciate uh, your input as well as your participation today and, and the generosity of your club, particularly being in an area that's relatively unaffected, uh, just deserves major kudos. So uh, roar to the Pendleton Lions Club and your leadership in helping to make that happen. I would like to add that Brian Rangich, the multiple district treasurer in the district uh, RE, I forget which district, uh, was very kind when I talked to him and said he would be willing to take on the work of accepting any donations from my district and seeing that they were allocated in a fair and responsible manner to where there were great needs. So my thanks to Brian for stepping up to help us with that. Much appreciated. And as many know, Brian Rangich is a proud Salem downtown lion. And I believe he's the treasurer, not only for the District R Lions, but the multiple District Lions and the Oregon Lions Sight and Hearing Foundation. So if there's a Lions treasurer somewhere in our multiple district, uh, Brian probably has some kind of an influence there. So I'll pass along your appreciation to Brian. So I'll be talking to him soon. Thanks again, John. Okay, so we're going to change gears slightly now and move into uh, response. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, Sharon Rollins, um, in addition to many other titles, um, holds the title of LCIF Multiple District Coordinator. Sharon, thanks for being here today, and thanks for giving an overview of uh, the emergency grant response process and other um, ways that LCIF is helping to respond. Okay, great, thanks. Um, oh, no. Get me back. We can hear you. Okay, but where did my picture go? Oh, we can everybody see everybody else lose it. I don't think so. We can still see you and we can hear you. Okay, well, what do I push to get the picture back? Go down to the possibly down the lower bar. You might have the little icon of go to webinar, the little blue and white icon. Uh -huh. But I'm not there. Well, we can see you and we can hear you. Yeah, but this is driving me crazy. <laughs> do you want should we come back to you? 
Oh, got it. I don't know why that happened. Um, okay, as far as the grants, you've heard a lot. I'm really sorry that District E wasn't able to do the exact needs that LCIF had. And uh, on behalf of Carol Lee, I had also been talking to LCIF about it, and they're pretty darn specific about where they want that money spent. Um, I tried to explain, as Linda had shared, that so many people have had to move animals, working animals, farm animals and all, um, and they have extreme expense because they've got these animals stashed places where there's no food, et cetera, but LCIF won't consider the dollar amount being spent on anything to do with animals, no matter what they are. Okay. So it is it is basically, as you heard, for food supplies, clothing supplies, and emergency cleaning supplies. That is what LCIF emergency grants are for. As Sherry knows, there's also a $20,000 larger term grant that can be applied for, which can be used for future help. And I think John knows that because part of that could have been done for the flooding as well. Sherry is working on that, and that's probably the better way for District O to go so that we can know what we can cover coming up uh, because we haven't, as Sherry explained, found exactly the way to meet the needs yet. And that $10,000 grant timing is just about to expire. In fact, it expires tomorrow, I believe. Uh, very close. So we are, we're gonna go for, under Sherry's great work, a $20,000 there. And I would suggest that District E try for that as well. If you can find out a way to work out the needs and then let LCIF know that it's very definitely long term. Um, other than that, there is an excellent Foundation Friday. Those are the videos that LCIF has been putting on the web that had to do with grants. They're hard to get to, but you can search for them on the LCIF bar at the LCI, LCI website. However, there is another one. Um, there's on the main site, go to LCIF and then go through the LCIF area and there is an LCIF grant tool kit, which has all of the information for each of the grants that would give you information you may not already have. Um, as far as eyeglass help, I don't know whether, did Carol Lee get an answer about whether eyeglasses would be covered? You don't know, okay. Because that was a question. Hearing aids are not covered. We found that out under the 10,000. We are hoping that eyeglasses are, and I haven't gotten an answer yet. If not, I believe they would be under the $20,000 grant. Um, Thanks to the foundation, we happen to have big boxes of readers here in our garage because my husband delivers them to the various shelters in the greater Portland, Tigard, whatever area. He spent last Friday dividing them into each of the strengths of the readers. So we have 130 readers in different groups ready to go, hoping that we can get them out to one of the marks so that you know, these don't need any testing. They can simply be given to people who can at least benefit from that. Uh, other than that, I would say you're all doing the best you can. And the next information comes from Charlene as to how we can perhaps do a better job of actually reaching people. So thank you. Thanks, Sharon. We're going to go to Charlene in just a moment. But I do have a question from one of our audience members that I'm going to pose to you, if that's okay. okay. Um, I believe this is from past district governor and past chair of the Oregon Lion Sight and Hearing Foundation, Red Rowley, a yeah. proud Forest Grove lion who asks or who, who says one of his friends in North Carolina said after the hurricanes flooded their towns last year that they were given debit cards for Lowe's and Home Depot and other retails. Is there any way? No. Okay. Okay. No, I'll answer that right now. LCIF will not allow any donations of debit cards or any kind of bank card, any kind of gift card. It has to be cash that is spent directly on the purpose. And that receipt then comes back, as Linda well knows, the receipt comes back to the person who's holding the money for disbursement. Sadly, no, they don't allow that. Okay, thank you for addressing that. 
and we'll encourage other members of our audience to use the chat box uh, to type in a question or a comment, and we'll do our best uh, not only to respond to them <clears throat> as they come in, but also at the end of our webinar. Um, we should have time that allows for that as well. Okay, um, our next panelist is Charlene Larson, who I know that many of you are aware has played a critical role um, as MD36 Lions Disaster Response Coordinator uh, for many, many years. Charlene, thank you for your service in that role. Thanks for joining us today, and, and what can you share with us? Well, it uh, doesn't take much to consider why we need to be prepared. And all the little seminars and stand-up workshops and such that uh, we've done over the years with Oregon Lions is uh, is starting is starting to pay off as far as folks being aware of what can happen in in this situation. So just kind of an overview of, of where we're at. Oregon Lions, and uh, you know, we're kind of still working on our on our new name, moving from alert to uh, Oregon Lions disaster response is part of Oregon VOAD. So what I've what I've been trying to do is first off um, really kind of plug each one of the district governors into the LCIF grant cycle. And Sharon has explained how that work it works and how it doesn't work sometimes. So uh, it's it's important to understand that. John Taylor and I have talked about that too, to really come up with a quick and easy kind of white paper when we get into a situation like this again so that we know where the steps are and you know we're not walking through the mud now linda she didn't need any help she went for it she got it and she figured it out how to you know how to do that quick response what also happens is that everyone is trying to help so there are spontaneous volunteers trying to help and in our coordinated effort and collaboration with Oregon BOAD and with the emergency managers and with the department, the Oregon Department of Emergency Management, there's, there's places there for volunteers to sign up. There's places for donations to be signed up and for needs to be signed up. And in the three weeks, four weeks since those fires have started, that's kind of the messy place that hasn't quite got itself going. And you have to look all over the place to figure out, you know, where the donations are, where the marks are. And it's tied to what each county has the capability to do in their emergency management department. And when you're overwhelmed with trying to fight a fire and keep it from spreading, everything to do with everybody who wants to help from throughout the country just is you know that that second disaster so our our clue to kind of how lions can help is our lions clubs around oregon and northern california uh, and through the district governors need to understand that they are our eyes and ears on the ground so when we email or when we call and say what's going on this is this is very helpful to understand that there's a mark in glide that a national voad partner through that whole system flew in little airplanes from california called reach out worldwide and ended up distributing uh, cleanup buckets in the Glide Gymnasium. So when you go to their website and look, they flew in, they came, and they distributed. However they got in touch with Douglas County, I don't know, but the same thing occurred in Douglas County 
with cleaning kits from the United Methodists. They put in truckload of cleaning kits in their warehouse in Salt Lake City and drove to Roseburg at the request of the Douglas County Emergency Manager and left hygiene kits, school kits, and uh, cleaning kits. So when you try to piece it all together, the marks are kind of where the action is for us as far as outreach to others. So there's a mark at Molala School Gym in, in Clackamas. So that, you know, that might be the good place to be as far as at a mark table, which is your multi-agency res uh, resource center. There's also one in Colton in Clackamas County. There's one at the Glide School. There's one in Medford at the old Medford Central High School. And then when you talk about shelters and kind of the play nice kind of game, you know, there are sheltered people and there are non-congregate shelters where people were put up in motels. And then there were the evacuees from the smoke that ended up in places like Astoria in the motels. And then they were looking for help. So our Clatsop Community Action, which is a social service agency, opened their doors to all comers who needed food, transportation cards, housing cards, but they were given vouchers by Red Cross to, you know, evacuate to these other places in non-congregant shelters because of the COVID-19 um, disaster. So when you look at a disaster, it becomes a little more complicated. Um, when we, we talked about, and this is in Linda's district, that holiday farm fire up the McKinsey, about 500 homes burned out there. And kind of the long-term disaster recovery for those places and for Phoenix in talent is those are the folks who have the least amount of funds to recover. So when you're looking at that long-term recovery, I would really urge our Lions Club to get involved with their long-term recovery groups in each one of the counties affected. And the United Way of the Pacific Northwest is also partnering with those long-term recovery groups in Jackson County, Lincoln County, Douglas County, Marion County, Lynn County, and Clackamas, Clackamas County. So the physical agent for each one of those long-term re recovery groups will be the United Ways in those areas. And you'll start to hear more about that. And the vetting process then becomes a, a real uh, case management kind of vetting pro process for all of the 6,000 people so far who have applied for FEMA help. So there's a whole casework piece that goes into place in each one of these long-term recovery areas. Um, and for Oregon Lions and that outreach for um, those needs, you have 3,000 Dis, uh, homes destroyed in that Phoenix talent area, and those are those are the folks who work in Ashland and Medford, and live in economically challenged housing, and that whole piece of that economic recovery. Um, you know, is being addressed by the governor through the Oregon Wildfire Advisory Council that'll be led by the Labor Commissioner of Al Hoyle and by the state treasurer, Tobias Reed. So if you're up close and personal with representatives and senators in your districts, 
and you know what the the needs are of those people affected by the wildfires don't be shy about speaking out because the most vulnerable the folks who have the least amount of resources are the ones who are going to need the most support so when you look at a lions club project and you understand that a small school district up the Santa Am can't afford to clean up the interior of the school from all the ash and the soot because their insurance policy doesn't cover that for them. It only covers if a fire is on your property and they're struggling. Is not that a good project for a Lions Club in an area? Uh, for cleaning up a facility, a school, a playground, something like that. But it's just those things that you have to pay attention to that fall through the cracks can become a service project for a Lions Club. So it's like eyes and ears on the ground. Get the information back to your district governor and back to me and I also will share all the information as Linda knows and John and Sherry and Carol Lee on what needs are that are coming my way from Oregon VOAD and from FEMA um, as far as housing and mass feeding and a place to put up AmeriCorps volunteers and that sort of thing. So there's opportunities. It's just making sure that we can kind of put it together and then share it. And then we have this collaboration, cooperation, and outpouring of of help that really makes a difference, you know, in the long term. And it will be long term. So thank you for the opportunity to share. And if there's any questions about an acronym that I threw out to you, you know, we'll have another session on those someday, right? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, I, I think we'll probably do a follow up to this, perhaps just exclusively on the effort of the multi agency uh, resource centers, um, which the acronym there is MARC, M A R C. Uh, and, you know, I just Googled really, really quickly, you know, multi agency resource centers in Oregon, and pretty much all the communities that have been affected by the wildfires, um, links come up for how to connect to those MARCs. Uh, in the Medford area, Jackson and Josephine County, and Cottage Grove and Lane County, pretty much all the fires in those communities, there are these marks that are set up. And, you know, my own personal opinion here is that, you know, Lions do such a great job of, of committing themselves to that motto of we serve. Um, but why not collaborate with these resources uh, that are available from an economy of scale standpoint to try to most efficiently utilize our support? And, and, and partner and collaborate with these agencies that are set up to help these victims. Um, so if you're looking for the mark in your area or in a particular area of the state that you want to partner with, just simply Google multi-agency resource centers in Oregon, and you should get lots of links that will come up. And you can uh, pick the area in the state that you want to consider collaborating with. I want to clarify the question that uh, came earlier regarding the gift cards. Um, apparently, I may have misunderstood the question. Um, but uh, Red says that the Lions Club, I think in North Carolina, was told to buy the supplies with the debit cards, not give the debit cards to the victims. I have to admit, I'm not sure how that's any different than taking the, the dollars and buying the supplies. But um, maybe maybe we can get some clarification on that question. I mean, Sharon, I'll just ask you, um, the, the dollars that come in to a district for these response grants, um, are you able to just go and maybe you already said this, so I apologize for asking you to re to repeat it, but can you purchase supplies with these dollars and then get them into the hands of a multi-agency resource center to help victims that way? Yes, you app see mine went down again. Um, yes, you can. You buy the supplies and then you are allowed to get reimbursed for the supplies. I, I'm not sure I would see the need of getting a debit card because you're, you're going to be out there shopping and you have to have that receipt 
because as Linda knows, if you don't have the receipt and the original receipt to turn in, you are not going to be repaid. So buying a debit card doesn't seem to me would follow LCIF rules. A club could do it, fine, but I don't see that fitting into LCIF. Okay, I would encourage anyone that wants to pursue that line of, of strategy to reach out to Sharon because you could use another couple dozen emails in your inbox, right, uh, to get some clarification on that. Because if somehow that's a vehicle to help people, then, then let's do it. But let's make sure that we're doing it in a way that is a reimbursable expense. Okay, so we're going to move along because we're getting really close to We try to keep these to an hour, but I want to give a couple of our staff members an opportunity to share just really quickly some of the uh, ways that we are looking at helping victims of wildfires. And, and we've got uh, Kelly on board visually, and Kareth Vance is also participating via phone. Um, I'm just going to hand it over to the two of you, Kareth and Kelly. Do you want to talk about ways that we are uh, partnering with vision providers to help people with eyeglasses and other ways that you want to share? Sounds good. Kelly, do you want to um, jump in from the from the optical team standpoint? Sure. Um, hello. Thanks for inviting us. So Kirith and I and Melinda have the opportunity. We sit on a, um, a committee. It's called the Oregon Vision Coalition. And what that is, is it's a it's a a coalition that we formed with um, Casey Outreach Van, Pacific University's Outreach Van. Bosch International, um, the opticians of Oregon, and us, because what we found in the past was that a lot of times agencies, like we might go somewhere and screen and for a community screening, and then the next week, Casey was there doing exams, and then a month later, Pacific was there. So we decided to kind of all work together so we're not replicating services, and it also allows us to kind of combine our forces to help out. And so something we've been doing, um, Melinda Rhodes, as, as everyone knows, Melinda and loves her. She's an amazing um, community event coordinator for the foundation. Um, we've been working with Casey, um, trying to figure out how we can get with their outreach van to go out to perform exams. And unfortunately, Casey, because of COVID, that's kind of what we're running into is there's a lot of agencies that are under a lot of restrictions because of COVID still, but we were trying to figure out how to get down near talent and Phoenix and different places, um, and we just can't get the van out there um, right now. But it's something that we're all working on, and, and um, it got to be a fly on the wall when Virian, who runs the Casey program, and Melinda were trying to coordinate, and we were trying to find different agencies where we could go um, to work with. And so that's something that we're actively all working on right now, is trying to figure out how we can leverage our partnerships so that we can get out and keep helping to serve Obviously, we have the ability to make eyeglasses, um, so we want to work with that. Um, a question I just do have is one thing that I know is that Sharon brought up readers, and um, readers are always something that's very sparse. And we actually have a call into one of my labs. I'm just trying to get a discount on buying stock lenses so that we could just edge a bunch of readers to push them out to you guys, because right now there are zero readers at our Lurk. Um, unfortunately, because they're one of the fastest things to go. Um, I wasn't sure if I know you said that the LCIF grant doesn't cover hearing aids, which is so sad, um, but I don't know if it would cover lens blanks that we could then turn around and edge and give back to you guys to distribute all over the state. Because as you know, readers don't have to have an um, optometrist or a MD there to oversee a site mission. Just a thought but we are um, trying to get discounts ourselves and we're trying to edge donated frames to kind of keep replenishing the lurk so we can keep help helping you guys out and Kelly, our team is always brainstorming everyone foundation yeah Kelly, Kelly sure. I will call this afternoon I will call Cassandra at LCIF and get a specific answer to that and then I'll let you know Thank you so much, Sharon. It's just a, a way that something we could tangibly make with our hands that we could push out to you guys to help all over the state. Um, but I want to see if Kirith has, because Kirith is amazing with all the programs that she oversees and all of her committees. Kirith, what do you have to share? Um, well, we've got a few things. Uh, one of the exciting uh, or well-timed uh, is kind of how things come together sometimes. You just, it's, it's amazing and you wonder, okay, how did that happen? But 
Um, we do have a grant that was made available or a donation that was made available in Lane County um, that's going to help us connect with people who have lost their um, vision, uh, like their glasses and so forth in the Lane County area. Um, there's a, a donor who's going to help um, if, if people have been uh, impacted by the wildfires in that area. We're working right now to figure out how to connect those individuals um, through the Lions in Lane County to um, the provider's office and, and get them some assistance. Um, our foundation also has um, access to um, a eyeglass and exam certificates um, that are donated through Vision Service Plan. And I actually just made a note to myself to double check and see. We haven't had a provider um, in specifically the Phoenix area, but I believe there was one um, in that area a while back. So I want to double check and just make sure um, what may be available there, as well as there are locations in District R that are outside of Lane County that I know we have providers in. Um, so just you know, reaching out to the lines and letting them know as far as glasses go. And then um, uh, we are connected to a lot of, uh, through the foundation office, to a lot of community service groups, a lot of nonprofits that do a wide variety of things as far as supplies and, and how, to, how to get things and how to connect them with people. And, um, and also just the foundation, you know, just our network of people we know, and we can use our social media and other outreach to help support the Lions as they find um, you know, what we can do to help, you know, while we get information from Charlene, um, and from, uh, the rest of the district governors and, and Sharon, um, about what's the best way for Lions to get together and, and really have an impact. I love the, um, I mentioned earlier of those school cleanups, those, those other things that may not necessarily be a, a vision and hearing thing, but they are going to impact our, our kids. Um, that we want to help. They are going to impact the communities that Lions are working with. And so I love the idea that the foundation could help get the word out on that, um, help our Lions Club, um, Lions Clubs work together um, in some way, you know, whatever we can do to help facilitate making that happen. And, and you know, Lions, we're, Lions are amazing. Like, uh, and being able to be on the ground and, and have an impact and, and get their friends and their neighbors to join in and help. So I know that um, once we have more information about the specifics of what we can do, um, we're just going to do whatever we can to help support that. And I know Melinda and I are, are working on finding out some hearing resources, too. You know, we do have capacity to take a mobile unit into different areas. And so there may be ways, um, whether or not the LCIF grants cover the cost, there's other ways that we can um, currently, especially there are funds available that we can help people who may have lost their hearing aids in the fire and don't have. Um, which most people don't, uh, ways of replacing those. And so I think um, between our ROAR program, our amazing optical lab and team, um, and just networking with all the providers that we have throughout the state, um, you know, just let us know how we can help, and we're going to be working behind the scenes to find some ways too. Thanks, Kevin. I want to um, kind of just sort of add a little bit to that from the standpoint that, uh, you know, our programs, the foundation's programs, you know, they're not restricted. Uh, in terms of having to help people um, that are victims of the wildfire or not. So the, the resources that we have, of course, can be dedicated to those that have been impacted by the wildfires. For example, um, Kareth, I think you alluded to the, um, the ROAR Hearing Assistance Program. There happens to be a fund that is dedicated to helping people in Lane County. Um, however, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, our Lane County Lions sight hearing chairs and others have encouraged us and our board approved it recently to make this fund available temporarily to people throughout the state. Um, and so while they don't have to be a wildfire victim, they certainly can be to take advantage of an opportunity to get a hearing exam and, and hearing aids really at, 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 at very little, if any cost uh, to them or the Lions Club. And we don't have enough time to go into all the details, but if you're interested in how to promote this opportunity to people in your area, let Kareth know, let myself know, and we'll connect you to uh, the resources that you can do that. I would think every Lions Club in Oregon and, and Northern California should send out a short press release saying, hey, if there are people in the community that have a need for sight or hearing services due to the wildfires or otherwise, contact the Oregon Lion Sight and Hearing Foundation because there may be resources available to help you. Um, 
let's see again our time is really really limited here uh, any comments oh i'm sorry yeah Somebody, Doug. yeah please do bob i just wanted to let everybody know that the southern oregon alliance sight and hearing center down in medford is assisting those people uh affected by the uh, alameda fire and they are providing and helping with classes and that stuff so if anybody is looking for another avenue to make donations to they would be readily accepted at uh, the southern oregon line of sight and hearing center excellent bob thanks for mentioning that um we very much want to support our friends in the medford area the southern oregon line of sight and hearing center and help in any way we can uh, to make their event successful in providing eyeglasses to those in need so bob thanks for mentioning that kelly and then and then linda um, I just want to, yes, Bob, Glory and her team are doing an amazing job down there. I'm sorry I didn't get to mention that I was trying to give Kira time. But I also just want to point out, we got asked a question. Um, it says, I'm a school nurse in Gresham Barlow. Can we continue to send in our request for vision check and glasses for our students in need? And um, Kira can answer this, but the answer is yes. But Kira can tell you more, Kathy. Thanks, uh, About uh, About KX? Uh, yes, yeah, we do taking. have a, an ongoing statewide program for kids. So anyone under 21 who's enrolled in a high school or high school equivalent uh, program or under all the way down through preschool or toddlers, um, if you have uh, any uh, news on a, a youth in need of um, replacement glasses, eyeglasses that, um, you know, sometimes it may be that if circumstances come up and their insurance can't replace them or something else is going on, um, just let us know because we do have a really well-funded program called KEX Kids that is active in most parts of MD36. So that includes Northern California and all of Oregon. So um, any of those questions just reach directly out to me. Kara, thanks for uh, for giving us that information. Um, thank you, Kathy. I'm from the Gresham Barlow area for participating in the webinar and asking that question. I just want to emphasize that one does not need to have been affected by the wildfires to qualify for the KX Kids Fund Eyeglass Assistance Program. Um, Linda, I know that you had, uh, I believe you had something that you wanted to say, and then we're going to uh, depart. Linda, yeah, you want to go ahead? I had just a couple points that I need sharing to provide clarification on. You said you have to have original receipts. You can't scan in receipt and send it. I don't know that scanning is, I don't think scanning is wrong, but what they will not let you do is photocopy something and then send the photocopy. Scanning oh. should work fine because we've been allowed to scan all of our reports, stuff sure. like that in, it's great. My other point was um, when I talked to Cassandra back at LCIF, she said you cannot apply for the ten thousand dollar grant and the twenty thousand dollar grant you can pick one or the other but you can't have both correct correct so that's why district o is going for the twenty thousand now because number one the deadline is nearly here and number two it's going to be long-term recovery type of work rather than short term for the ten thousand well of course the fires up around gates and all state and all that area there's probably a lot of you know long term mm -hmm. where are you getting the deadline from i've never seen an actual hard deadline um i've got the application it says within 30 days of the emergency well, yeah the emergency though spreads out um True. it definitely spreads out so i think you'd have well, to ask cassandra the specific about that okay yeah because i've got one two there's three fires that were in august and then the rest have all been in september right so. hey linda linda would you be willing to seek clarification from cassandra in terms of that 30-day deadline i would imagine that being that the wildfires are still taking place that probably that deadline may not be ending as soon as we might think and then we'll share that information with all of our webinar attendees at this point i wanted to thank all of our panelists uh, for participating Thanks so much for uh, sharing the information that you are aware of and for your time. Thanks to our audience. Uh, we, had a, we had a good turnout. Um, particularly appreciate those that uh, participated and asked uh, questions. Um, Kathy's question about, uh, as a school nurse, can they continue to send in requests for vision checks and eye exams? Segues perfectly into promoting next week's webinar. 
where the topic is, so your child needs eyeglasses, now what? Um, Kareth and others will be providing lots of information on the resources available to help children throughout Oregon receive much needed comprehensive eye exams and eyeglasses when needed. So with that, thanks very much uh, for everybody for participating. I hope you have a great day. Thanks for your service, for helping those in need, and I hope we see you soon.